This is an attempt to talk about cultural sensitivity, a very important feature for anyone interested in being involved in global neurosurgery, global health, volunteer, or working in developing countries or low-income countries. The important lessons that have been learned, that I've learned over parts of three decades of work, are very clear. I've made many mistakes, but I always try to learn from them, to only make the mistake once, or even better, to learn from someone else's mistakes, which I hope you would learn from mine. So I'd like to emphasize four major lessons of cultural sensitivity, mistakes made and lessons learned from them, that I think are very applicable to any type of volunteerism or any type of activity that you wish to be involved in. The first is to understand that global volunteerism in medicine has many facets and many stages. The first, you're overwhelmed by the need. The second, you're a nurse surgeon, you're very bullheaded, you want to treat everybody, you want to take care of everything, you try to fix everything yourself. And the final, the one we aim for, is that you try to leave something lasting that is not about you. Because when you understand that global volunteerism is not about you, it's about the people you serve or the patients who have not even been born yet, who you'll never be able to serve, then you make progress. You see that many of us wish to serve and emulate heroes, such as Dr. Schweitzer, Dr. Dooley. These are people that really inspired generations of people to go out and serve. And during this Schweitzerian phase of most volunteers, they try to do everything. I myself once tried to operate on all 11 million people in one region until the local doctors told me, you can't do that, you're fast, but you're not that fast. And you need to come meet our culture, see our people, understand our needs. Because the countrysides of the developing world are littered with failed medical experiments, clinics that are no longer staffed, projects that sounded promising and never were finished. And there are distinct reasons for this. One is, quite simply, service alone doesn't last beyond you. When you do service and just service, you have to ask yourself, who is being benefited? And the honest answer is we. We are. We're better people for it. We're proud of ourselves. We're achieving our objectives. That's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with service. But you have to understand that the people you affect are limited. The three, if you go and do three very fancy skull-based tumors in a developing area, then you will be proud of yourself. The people that you showed the surgeries to will be dumbfounded, and the three patients will be very, very blessed, but their chances of that were about the odds of them winning the Powerball. Very unlikely to serve others. Or conversely, if you were to do, say, 100 cleft palates, I would guarantee you that you will leave resources depleted, that you'll leave an uh, overwhelmed system, that you will leave doctors angry at you because you have shown them up in the eyes of the people that, they, that believe they were not capable of taking care of that. And that's a mistake. So the lesson that I learned from this is that service through education makes sense. The issue of a government involvement in an area of need is very, very important. It was made very clear to me one time when working in an area with a corrupt government, it was made clear that that government was actually maintaining that they did not have to invest in health care if the NGOs did all the work. And of course, that would never allow it to be self-sustaining. The lesson there was that it must be a program of the people of that region which you partner with, which you assist, but not that you do the work for them, because that will not be self-sustaining. My friend Ben Worf has taught us that by going to serve in Uganda. He saw the need, built a wonderful hospital, which he trained and staffed the Africans in Uganda to, to care for it, and to do research and to build upon, in a true academic center, something they had never had before to build new and ideas. And therefore, when you begin to think about service through education, you can benefit many other people. So we think about this, and now where there were no neurosurgeons for 400 million in training, now there are hundreds. 
and that changes everything about the way we can do it. So for me, it happened in Guatemala when I was trying to take care of everyone and I saw a child who was not ill. And I asked myself, who will care for that child when I'm not here and it becomes ill? And that's the first day I began to really train doctors. And that made sense. That was my type of service. So have benefit and try to think who you are training because they'll never know who I was, nor do they need to, because it's really not about you. Second lesson, assuming you know the needs of others. We're brilliant, we study a lot, we read the Lancet Commission report, there's five billion people worldwide in need of surgical aid, we're there to help, we charge in on a white horse. Remember, when you enter an area, when you enter a culturally different area, you were given two eyes, two ears, and one mouth, Close that mouth, use the ears and the eyes. Listen, look. They will tell you their needs. These local doctors are brilliant at using very few resources and getting medical care done. Learn from them. You're there to learn. That's a way it can benefit you in a very good way. But they will teach you their needs. They will tell you. And then as a dyad, you can work with them and say, well, I could come and teach this particular thing you need or I can bring this equipment you need and not reams of books they'll never, they'll never read or papers they'll never be able to read or equipment that breaks immediately. Ask, listen, look, and you'll be taught. That's one of the most important lessons. I learned this in an almost humorous way when I was working in the Amazon. I was new, but I was pretty smart. I had looked at the resources, the facilities, the types of diseases, but fortunately, I asked the local health uh, official what was their number one need, even though I thought I knew it. His answer was quite simple. We need more dugout canoes to bring the patients in. I had no clue he was going to say that. And when you begin to understand that you don't know everything, you've learned a lot by listening. Third lesson, very little education takes place in war zones. In war, the educated people are considered a threat, and that's a concern. On the right is a man who has just stuck a rifle through my clinic window. You've heard of focused neuro exam. Nothing focuses your exam more than having someone stick a rifle at you. And this was an area of guerrilla activity and unrest. And I really could not do more than just simple service there. It's valuable, and there are whole groups that are doing that. But to have lasting impact requires changing and self-sustaining that. It's very hard to do in a war zone, so we must partner with the sort of people who can change the way things are done. That means governments. That means a stable middle class. We cannot do this alone. We need those partners. Contrary to the issue of trying to develop a teaching program or an educational program in a war zone would be this. On the left is the president of Tanzania at the time when he dedicated 15% of his budget to health care if we would help him coordinate that. This sort of partnership of a stable government or a stable middle class is really the hallmark of a self-sustaining program of health care, which is what we strive to achieve. And your trainees in these conditions may be seen as a threat. In the middle of this picture is one of my heroes. This young lady is training to be a neurosurgeon in a difficult part of the world. And when I asked her what was her major need, what was her major threat, thinking I knew what it was, she answered in a way I had never expected. She said, Boko Haram, a group that is against education, and she was fighting them. I came back saying, I will do anything I can to support this group, this lady, and my residents at home, I told them they didn't have any real problems compared to what I had learned by listening in another part of the world. And finally, you may have to think on your feet. I was once going to staff a clinic, and unfortunately when I arrived in a war zone, there was nobody there. This is very bad. I could see a group of armed individuals, they did not speak a language that I understood. Our interpreter 
started to talk. There was a lot of yelling and arm raising. I said, this is very bad. But I looked in the homes surrounding the courtyard and I saw little tiny eyes. I very carefully got out of the Jeep, picked up three rolls of tape showing my hands and started juggling. Within seconds, I had 30 children around me and the gorillas said, he's either crazy or harmless and they let us go. Sometimes you'll be put in the situations you don't expect and therefore you need partners that keep you safe or change the world or that middle class in that society, they're dedicated to changing it in a lasting way beyond what you can do. Real progress then is a partnership with governments, that middle class, and a desire to improve through education and peace. Lesson four, very importantly, you are responsible. You are responsible for those you train. You're responsible for those patients you care for, just as you are for patients at your own institution. You're responsible for the volunteers you work with, the family you may bring with, and the, and the families of those patients, just as you are. You talk to them, you treat them respectfully, you never lose track of their culture, their personality. And there are major threats along this. To the volunteers you work with, my major two are illness and transportation problems, because this can be extremely difficult. Others, such as civil unrest, natural disasters, and violence, I'll mention. But illness is so important, especially dysentery. We all tell stories of the time we had some sort of illness on a trip. But if your volunteers are above 60 or below 20, they may, especially at altitude, they may become quite ill. I've had to evacuate both old and young volunteers when they got these GI illnesses and could not hydrate, could not maintain organ function. Malaria, HIV, Ebola, prevention is key. Barrier protection, clean water. My record is 18 volunteers sick in one day. Because of my allergies, I eat very plainly. Cooked chicken, cooked rice, that's it. But 18 of them who were trying to experiment with local food got sick simultaneously. I went from OR to OR closing cases and trying to then care for them, giving them antibiotics, treating them, and then when I rounded back on them at the, at, the, at the bodega, one of the nurses was having an anaphylactic reaction to the antibiotic I had given. I had to treat that. Believe me, the next trip I brought an internist for the volunteers and very strict rules about vaccinations, medications, and barrier precautions because you're responsible for those people that you are training and working with. Transportation is a threat. When I was young and stupid, I climbed on top of the train. That makes no sense. I need to know who's driving because the roads are poor. One of our institution's uh, groups, a medical group going on in overseas um, health care uh, uh, trip, was hit by a train with their van. And that really taught the lesson you cannot be overly safe about such things. You need to know who's driving, what are they eating, where's the clean water. Natural disasters. My biggest concern are earthquakes and tsunamis, but I literally have had this volcano erupt outside the hospital. It changes when you finish the case and say, how are things? And they say the, the volcano's eruption, erupting. We're trying to figure out which way the lava is going to flow. So you have to consider these. But at the same time, you work in areas that are, that are low income often comes with that in an unstable government. And if you finish the case and you have two armed guards, you know the government just fell. And sometimes you have to anticipate that. We, for example, will pull volunteers out of some countries before the election in case the outcome causes some unrest. It may pass and we can go on with our work, but you cannot be too safe. And you're responsible for not only your patients who could be signaled out, your trainees, but in my case, I take my family and try as I might. This is my daughter who, as a child, did not want to simply lift boxes, taught herself the language, took over the recovery room, ran, found doctors, comforted children. She was wonderful. But in spite of my best efforts, she was put in a period of great danger at one occasion in spite of the things I did not predict. 
And although I got us out of that, it changes your life forever. So there are many things, and these are the lessons. If you're going to be involved in global neurosurgery, global health, or work in low or middle income countries and try to serve, I urge you to understand that service with education is lasting. You're not there to do it, you're there to help them do self-sustaining work. You can participate side by side, try to leave something more. Second, be quiet. Look, listen, and learn. In this way, you'll learn what you can do to help them, and more importantly, how you can be part of that. You'll be equally as proud of that, and you won't get credit that you don't deserve. Lesson three, Education requires stability, as does any health system. You cannot do this alone. Be involved with the middle class. Be involved with the minister or the government. Be alert to that because you need to keep them safe. And be alert that sometimes your efforts can cause people to be singled out for harm. You have to be aware. And finally, you are responsible for many. Yourself, but more importantly, your family, your trainees, your patients, the people you go to assist, and understand that they are helping you. And when you think of this total mission of global neurosurgery, you're thinking not of yourself, but of the patients that are treated and the patients who will be treated long in the future after you're gone. That's my ideas of cultural sensitivity. That's the idea of a successful global volunteerism. Thank you.